I already informed you that I am coming to Dubai and Abu Dhabi in the first week of October. Our meeting in Abu Dhabi is on the 5th of October. Those desires of meeting me in Abu Dhabi on 5th of October may contact the WhatsApp number and the email ID given below. In case you have not already done so, kindly do so at the earliest. They are limited seats. Hi everyone, welcome back to Be Rich. It's me Vinod and Shashwat here again. Uh, both of us are recording remotely. And uh, last time around we spoke about Howard Marks' uh, memo. This time he's got something new for us, Shashwat. So what is the today's topic, Shashwat? What do you have for us today? Yeah, so today I want to talk about uh, the ex-Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi. And he recently published a report which basically talked about where the EU, that is the European Union, was currently standing and where it needs to be. And if it needs to be there, then how do we get there? So that's what Mario Draghi had talked about. And I thought it would be an interesting discussion, which I wanted to bring to the table and get your views on. So I thought we could discuss that. So what is uh, Mario Draghi saying about? So Mario Draghi basically starts off by looking at few key data points. So he says that clearly growth in the US has outpaced growth in Europe, but he's not just looking at any random measure. He's looking at very pertinent measures to how you could classify the average well-being in both the US and the EU. So one measure which Mario Draghi talks about is um, this thing known as disposable income per person. So disposable income is a quite a, a, a simple definition in, in the uh, field of economics. It basically just says any income after you've minus taxes and whatever social security that needs to be paid to the government, uh, the rest of that income is your disposable income. So this is the definition of disposable income. And of course, with disposable income, most of us would spend it on our necessities first and then the wants which we have uh, otherwise. So when you look at the disposable income of people in Europe and the US, we basically see that the disposable income of an average person in the US has far outpaced that of Europe over the past few decades. And Mario Draghi basically says that this is concerning because the EU was on par with the US for quite a while. And this divergence has come in at a at breakneck pace very recently, uh, over, that is over the past few years. And he says that this is something which is concerning when it comes to the well-being of uh, people in the EU. So if you have a lower disposable income, it basically means that I get to spend less now. Uh, I get to spend less on my necessities as well as my wants and desires. So even if I wanted to buy uh, food, I would have to take it into consideration the fact that my budget is now lower than uh, what it could have been if I kept pace with the US. So given that, Mario Draghi also talks about labor productivity in the EU versus the US. So labor productivity is nothing but a measure of, I guess, as the name suggests, the productive ability of one single uh, person who works in the economy. And if you look at the relative labor productivity between the US and the EU, the EU is only 80% or lower than 80% as productive as uh, the US, which again is concerning given that your population is now aging and in some places shrinking. Uh, if your labor is not more productive, it doesn't become more productive, then you basically have a situation where you are consuming less because you're going to be producing less because there are less people working now and your labor productivity isn't going up enough to match the decline in your uh, workforce. And that basically spells degrowth or even shrinking of your economy, uh, which is what Mario Draghi talks about. And he says these are two big issues along with the GDP uh, slowing down compared to the US, which he has identified uh, amongst EU versus the US. So these are the problems which he set out. What do you think about the problems before we move into what Draghi has to say about the solutions? Well, I think some of this is because of the inflation battling which the EU has been doing over the last couple of years. Since the spike in inflation, they have been trying to choke hold money supply and that may have affected the disposable income in Europe. Of course, US has also been choking money supply, but for some reason there, there's been so much of free cash flowing in the US it's not choked as the way it's choked in Europe because uh, interest rate cycles which were going upwards, trending upwards in Europe, had far more dramatic impact on the population than has had in the US. Yes, Fed did, did raise the rates, but the American market kept on going the way it's going. The labor market kept on going the way it's going. The housing market 
did not cool off the way it was thought it was going to happen. And a lot of things which were written doomsday when Fed raised those interest rates really did not play out the way we imagined it would. And we said, there's no way this is going to be a soft landing. It has landed softer than a feather, I think all I can say right now. I mean, I know we're still in the middle of it because interest rate cycles have just started ticking downwards. We are far from over. But looking at the way it is right now, all the doom and gloom which was there in the US doesn't seem to have transpired. Well, Europe has been having a series of battering done to its economy. And the whole Russian-Ukraine war has not helped. Putting a lot of the bill for Ukraine and supporting Ukraine has been a big strain on the European economy, which has been eating into them. So all this coupled with the China situation, where they have been told to be cold towards China on the dictatum of the US, has not helped either. So countries, which is a powerhouse of the European economy, a country like Germany, has been struggling. And we all heard about what happened in the Volkswagen plant a few weeks back, where in its 81-year history, the first time they're thinking of actually shutting down the plant, and they're going back on terms and agreement which they signed with the labor force uh, 30 years back, which they said it was supposed to be sacred to them, is now being thrown out. Because simply speaking, economically, Europe is in a far worse shape than the US is at this current juncture. So I'm not surprised. All this, what you're saying, should be very matter of fact. And it's been written on the wall for Europe, for, I would say, for the past couple of years. It's not something shockingly new. Yeah, And this explains also the rise of populism across Europe, where you see governments from being very liberal and being towards the left, being dragged more towards the right, and the harsh policies toward migrants, which are being felt across Europe, is also because of this. Yeah. So I, I agree with uh, a lot of the points you're making. And uh, Mario Draghi talks about, so he identifies certain key factors which have changed in the European economic sphere as compared to the US. So the first factor he identifies is that Inflation is going to be a very painful uh, problem in the EU. And Mario Draghi himself says that certain things have definitely changed almost permanently, at least for the time being, in the EU's economic sphere. So when you look at inflation, uh, you brought up inflation as uh, one of the things which the EU was struggling with, which is true. And this struggle comes from the fact that, like you rightly pointed out, the Ukraine conflict is continuing to spill over into the EU's economic sphere. And with the conflict they have in Russia, which basically means that they can't source cheap piped gas anymore, energy prices in the EU has gone up by two times or three times what it used to be. So it's two to three times the uh, cost in the US. So the US is now enjoying cheaper energy prices than the EU. So it basically has more room to play with the interest rate at least that's how I would see it, that they have more room to play with the interest rate than the EU does. Because in a country like Germany or Sweden or any northern country of the EU, you basically have to acknowledge the fact that in the winter you have no other option apart from consuming energy to keep yourself warm. This is a, a basic need which much of us in India don't really have. Some of us in India do have this need, but a lot of us living in the south don't have this need. That is the added energy cost. In the summers, yes, it's like us turning on our ACs, which is inc increasingly becoming a necessity. But for the Europeans, this has always been a necessity. At least in Chennai, very recently, it has become a necessity. But in the past, it wasn't so bad. So this is one problem which we're facing in the EU. Another problem which he identifies is that if you look at the number of big tech startups and the big tech companies which have emerged over the past two decades, 99% of them have been outside the EU. It's either been in China, India, or the US. It has had nothing to do with the EU, even if the people who originated, or rather the people who came up with the idea were Europeans in the beginning, they ended up sourcing funding in the US or in uh, a different part of the world and did not source funding within the EU. In fact, he shows us very stark statistics which show us that the VC funding in the European Union is maybe 20% or even 15% of what it is in the U is in the US. And he says that we know that the EU is known for regulation and regulation is not a bad thing in general. 
it, it basically gets bad when you don't have coordinated regulation, he argues, and regulates the things which you actually want to regulate in the way it needs to be regulated. So if you just have a bunch of loosely thought of regulations which aren't synchronized together and changes from country to country, even though you call yourself a union, then it's going to be very difficult for tech startups to run their business in the EU, especially if you look at tech companies like Apple, Microsoft, uh, Google, all of them fighting cases in the EU to basically pay millions of millions of euros in taxes and fighting for a lot of their rights, which they don't actually have to fight for in the US. So this is something which, and I'm not debating on whether they are ethically wrong or whether these, uh, you know, these regulations should not be in place. What Mario Draghi is stating is the fact that there are factually more regulations in the EU than there is in the US. And that's turning out to be a competitive disadvantage, pushing talent into the US rather than people wanting to stay and do something in the European Union. So these are some of the causes uh, he has identified. And the solution he puts out is the fact that one, the European Union is extremely scattered in terms of fiscal policy. Yes, we have a European Central Bank, the ECB, but we do not have uh, you know, a centralized fiscal planning policy in place where you can make strategic investments in places where you need to make strategic investments. He says it's time to wake up uh, because the European Union is heavily dependent on the US and other strategic allies for its defense when it's actually almost incapable of rendering its own defense if the U.S. were to step out of the NATO agreement. So if the U.S. one day, if let's say Donald Trump decides to come into uh, power and he decides to back out of any agreement with the European Union, they are on their own against Russia. And the fact that there has been a tilt towards demilitarization in the EU is going to be a pain for them in a more fragmented world according to Mario Draghi. So the fact that you don't have a sort of unionization in terms of fiscal policy or planning and you have uh, extreme reliance on certain key factors to your own statehood depending on other countries which don't really have a vested interest in you basically means that uh, you're going to suffer a lot at, due to the fact that the world is unpredictable and it's growing more and more unpredictable as time moves on. So he argues that one, uh, public sector investment needs to go up. That is, the government needs to spend a lot more than it is currently spending. And he argues that private investment needs to go up. And he says that these thing, two things can't magically come about. The missing puzzle or the step in middle between getting from the first to the third step is the fact that you need to bring down regulation and you need to regulate where regulation really needs to be there. So you need to stop regulating where there need not be regulation or it's not effective. And you should uh, start giving green lights to uh, startups and the tech sector. And he gives us a st stark fact that if you subtract the tech sector in the US's economic performance, the EU and US are pretty much on par. So the US has made this incredible jump in comparison to the EU predominantly because it has encouraged its tech sector or even if not encouraged hasn't hampered its own tech sector and it's been able to draw talent from everywhere in the world so he says that if the eu wants to stick to its target of you know carbon neutral or uh, you know a green clean uh, state and if the eu wants to stick to its target of inclusive development all of these things are very fancy and very nice to say out loud but you need to understand the fact that if you do not you know, bring a unionized fiscal policy, which basically means that you're not competing amongst yourselves to get more of the small share of pie, which you have instead of actually growing the size of the pie, you're going to have a lot of trouble and you're going to fall even further behind to the United States is the argument that Mario Draghi is making. So what do you think about his argument? Well, I agree. And the biggest advantage US has over EU is its bureaucracy. Yes, American politics is messy, but for all its messiness, whichever party out of the one comes to power gets the steering wheel and they can steer it very freely for four years the way they want. And very few are the times when they get to a point where they get into a deadlock where nothing happens. Yes, nothing gets passed in Congress has been an advantage or to its sword for the tech sector in the US. It's not that the American government planned the tech sector and incubated it and let it grow. It's just like how in India, 
when Manmohan Singh opened up the economy, he knew he could not change labor laws and he allowed services and industry to take off. And it grew freely because there's no bureaucracy in it. Same way the Americans, their tech sector grew without bureaucracy being shoved down their throats just because the government was caught napping and it just came into fruition over there. Europe does not have that. That is very, very true. And the second point which he says is the Europe has an obsession with bureaucracy. Every single thing has multi layers of bureaucracy. That's one on the EU level. Then when you filter it down to each country, it gets even more crazy. Even within countries, within regions, let's say you're in one region of Germany and you want to go to another region and pick up a job because of unemployment there and uh, you find a job in another area, it is not even easy to move or get like a driving license to be a truck driver there because of the bureaucracy. And that is a problem. And I don't see them fixing it because they are very so used to their bureaucracy and the bureaucracy machine is so huge and it's fed so well. I don't see it just collapsing upon itself in European markets or union or whatever you want to say, because it's got stranglehold on the continent. I don't see any leader coming there who can shake that up because they don't have a centralized leader like that. Each region and each country has its own leaders who have a local standing and who can polarize locally, but they don't have a European leader who can steer the continent as a whole. And I don't see how they can get out of this in the short term. And uh, look at recent developments. You brought up Germany, which is a good example. So look at recent developments in Germany where you basically have them bringing in border control against not people like us, but against people of their own skin color. I mean, that's crazy. You, the entire point of bringing in the European Union to fruition was the idea that you can move from one place of the subcontinent to another within yourself, the Schengen area, without having any restrictions. But now suddenly, the biggest player in this entire situation, the one which is supposed to lead the European Union, de facto, of course, you suddenly started saying that, you know, if you're going to come in, I need to, you know, see all these documents and I need to basically verify so many different things before I let you inside, even though you have a visa which permits you to come into my territory for free and we agreed to this and the entire idea of a European Union is free mobility of labor and people amongst uh, regions. So this, I think the misplaced aggression onto, you know, globalization or rather having no borders or no boundaries between countries, what made the EU succeed is what they're working so hard to destroy. If you look at a, a country like the UK, the UK clearly lost its way in terms of understanding that one of their biggest strengths was that they could access an entire market in the mainland uh, and they could basically source cheap labor whenever they wanted to from there and they could export goods after they produced it back into the mainland. And you had this access to a huge market and then you had Brexit and then you basically brought up this entire artificial wall which you put between the island of yours with the mainland and now you look at the UK's economy which is doing extremely uh, poorly compared to even the EU. So this tells me that if uh, like Mario Draghi said you're in this now you've already bit the bullet and you've accepted free market principles in certain angles by creating a unified market or even trying to create a unified market if you now try to step outside this arrangement, it's going to be worse for each single country than if they were to go deeper into this arrangement is what I feel. And it seems to me that it's easier to snip ties than to make ties stronger. And most political leaders in the EU are happy to promote this idea of snipping ties rather than actually building stronger ties uh, because it's going to win them votes easier when you villainize another person. And this is coming to the detriment of their economic reality. And like we discussed in yesterday's video or a few videos before, if your political reality doesn't mesh well with your economic reality, you're going to have your economic reality suffer because you're going to bring in policies which don't really work in the real world. So I think that the EU needs to wake up and it needs to figure out, even if you don't do as much as what Mario Draghi is saying, I think it still is worth listening to what his ideas are and seeing the warnings he's giving out because you have two choices where you get to continue down the same path or you get to take a different one. And it seems to me that the EU is not even aware that there are two paths. I agree. And uh, the solution is not simple. 
just because you have, like Mario Draghi has laid out a roadmap, the amount of pain you have to be willing to accept taking that is what people are hesitating on. And then you have regional leaders in Europe because regionally each leader can be very strong because he's got his base and they cling on to that base. They don't want to cooperate and work together. And there's lots of lack of cooperation regionally. And uh, Germany is also facing a lot of backlash locally inside their country for trying to pander and be the big brother to everybody. The Germans are saying, why should we do this when no one wants it? That's basically what's happening in Germany. And forget people from outside Germany going inside. It's becoming hard for Germans within Germany itself to move around freely and work freely because of the amount of bureaucracy which is built inside Germany itself. And the old uh, feelings of East and West in Germany is also still felt even till today, which is very funny that one would think, assume that considering everything that's come and gone, that would have also gone, but it's not. It's still there. So I don't know. Yes, but a lot of it needs to come on a macro level is what I feel. You know, this Russia-Ukraine thing has to come to some kind of conclusion. This Israel-Palestinian-Lebanon thing now, which has become worse, some kind of conclusion. The Americans and the Chinese need to bury their axes and come to some kind of conclusion. Then we can talk about how to fix things. As long as these ideological and political things are there on the table, economic things are going to always take the back seat till things are completely broken down. Like what happened during 2007, 2009, when the world economy looked like it was going to seize up, then everyone woke up. Right now, we are in a lull because we just think no matter what, things are just going to chug along. Even no matter how much damage we're doing to economies, somehow they seem to be crawling and moving along. Interest rates were raised to the roof. And even then, the markets didn't react. And, you know, I'll, the magic bullet seems to be in everyone's mind is technology, that AI and all kinds of technology is going to save humanity. And then, of course, this whole dream of boundless energy through nuclear fusion, which is also a pipe dream, because nothing is, even if it is proven, it to become something where we can use and harness is going to be years away. Even when it's plugged in with AI and AI helping us with computation is miles away. So we need to somewhere along the line as a species wake up to this. Either it's, it's going to be, you know, like an economic threat, which will finally wake us up, or it could be an existential threat, like the environmental threat, which will finally wake us up. Or I don't know what will create a wake up call for humanity to realize that, you know, we have had enough wars. We have had enough conflicts. A bit of cooperation isn't a bad thing. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so I agree with you. And uh, I think that this is a classic case of game theory where you keep pushing short term incentives until the point, you know, the breaking point where now it becomes who's going to put the last straw, which might break, might or might not break the camel's back. And I think there's just one last point which I want to make is that. Regardless of what happens to Europe, I think there's a learning lesson for Indians here because the EU's population is tiny compared to India. And I can only imagine what we have already achieved through unity and what more we can achieve through unity. I think there's a lesson to be learned regardless of what the Europeans do. I think the Indians have a lesson to learn from uh, how and how not to operate a union. I agree. I do agree. Anyway. Let's end on a note of optimism, as always. Thanks, Shashwat, for bringing us this article. It was very interesting to have this discussion with you, debating both sides of it. As uh, viewers out there who have seen this, please do put down in comments what you feel we should do or shouldn't do going forward. All views are welcome. We're eager to read your comments and to see if maybe we can do a follow-up on this and discuss this further. Do share and like this video and share it with friends and family who might find this content interesting. And as always, and me and Shashwat wish you the best. And thank you for watching the video today. Thank you for watching. Hey guys, welcome back to Be Rich. I wanted to bring to your notice that my uncles Vinod Srinivasan, Anand Srinivasan and I have rolled out a sub stack, which is basically a blog slash newsletter where we're going to post our original research onto it. And we've analyzed macroeconomic trends. And a lot of you know, my uncle Anand Srinivasan and I regularly write for the Hindu. And these articles are also going to be made available for you in the Substack. The link is moatmoteinvesting.substack.com. You'll find it in the description and in the video right now. 
Um, we hope you go check it out. We've put a lot of time and effort into it. And please give us comments and feedback on what you read. Thank you. It's a great privilege and honor that so many of you in thousands have subscribed to my channel and have supported me. I have written two books in English, The Alchemy of Money and Ordinary Stocks, Extraordinary Profits. These books are published by us and are ready. If you want to procure a copy, send us a message to the WhatsApp number given below and my team would respond to you. If you want an Amazon Kindle copy, you can click the link below. Finally, those who wish to consult with me can send a mail to berichenglish at gmail.com. Once again, I thank you for your support. If you like this video, press the subscribe button of my channel, hit the like button and turn on the bell notification.